talk to a lot of audiences, mostly um, academic audiences. So a room full of socialists is a great treat. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very glad to be here, and I'm going to start with the question, why are we? Why are we here? Why, why have we chosen, why do we continue to choose the politics of democracy and social justice? What keeps us going? in the face of many defeats, in the face of growing inequality, more and more Americans living in poverty, the erosion of the welfare state, an increasingly regressive tax system. Max Weber's famous definition of politics as the slow grinding of hard wood seems to apply especially to those of us who work for a more egalitarian society for the powerful and the rich, and for the ideologues who support them, and for the demagogues and opportunists who serve them, the wood has always been softer, the grinding easier. Tyrants and warlords around the world don't grind at all, they cut right through the wood. Even the word slow seems an exaggeration for us since it implies steady, whereas <coughs> our experience of politics Think of Barack Obama's victory in 2008 and the disastrous defeat of 2010. Our politics is more often like one step forward, two steps back. So why do we continue to hope for and work for the next step forward? But let me tell you a story about my hometown, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where I lived from when I was nine years old until I left to go to college. Johnstown was a steel town, pretty much owned by Bethlehem Steel, one of the largest U.S. companies. The workers were from Eastern Europe, mostly immigrants and first-generation Americans. There was a company store and no union. Johnstown was the place where the little steel strike of 1938 was broken. The attempt to organize a union defeated, so it seemed <coughs> decisively. <coughs> But that defeat wasn't the end of the story. The struggle to establish a steelworkers union continued with help from Democrats in the state capitol in Harrisburg and liberals in Washington. A Senate committee led by the progressive senator from Wisconsin, Robert LaFollette. There was a progressive party in Wisconsin in those years. The LaFollette committee launched an investigation into what had happened in Johnstown. Its report condemned the mayor and members of the city council for their role in breaking the strike. They had been literally in the pay of the steel company. And then during the war, with the federal government intervening to stop any, to prevent any stoppage of steel production, a union was finally organized. But the passive voice was organized isn't right were what really happened in Johnstown, on the ground, starting in the late 1930s, was a large-scale political mobilization. Organizers came from outside, socialist and communist militants sent by the CIO. But the people who counted, and who should count for us still today, were the men and women in Johnstown who responded to their efforts. People previously passive and inarticulate, who never imagined themselves as political agents, began to speak and to act. They organized meetings. They stood up at the meetings to complain about working conditions in the mills and about the poverty of steelworker families. They asked and they began to answer the classic political question, what ought to be done? They wrote leaflets, ran picket lines, negotiated with the police, encouraged each other, argued with workers who held back. And they finally won, established a union, and elected some of themselves as its first officers. And they changed the lives of Johnstown workers, their own lives. Unionization was above all a kind of collective self-help. Some of the changes were material. Suddenly, steel workers had a little money. They were less anxious about visits to the doctor. They could become consumers, not a bad thing when you have known poverty. They could buy a washing machine, nicer clothes for the kids. 
maybe even a piece of jewelry, not for the mother usually, but for a much-loved daughter. They could afford a summer vacation. Some of the changes involve what we might think of as the politics of every day. The tyranny of the factory floor was overthrown. The foreman was no longer a master. And all the civil servants in the city and the townships around it were suddenly civil, more accessible and more friendly than they had ever been before. It didn't happen that Johnstown became an egalitarian society, but its inequalities were significantly reduced. There was less deference on one side, less arrogance on the other. The city became a better place. Well, we know that what comes next is less inspiring. The children of the militants inherited the Union and didn't have to fight for it. That moment of intense activism didn't last. As sociologists say, the movement was routinized. It became routine. And now, some 70 years later, the mills are closed and empty. The union is no longer a presence in Johnstown, and there probably isn't any union at all where the steel is currently produced in Brazil or China. Still, that moment of political creation those years when men and women came alive as articulate and passionate agents of their own destiny, that is a time of supreme human value. It doesn't matter that it isn't permanent. So long as we understand that it is recurrent, it will happen again. Perhaps with the occupations, it is happening again. The occasions of future democratic and egalitarian militancy could be the same as in the past. If steel workers in the third world, for example, follow in the footsteps of their first world predecessors, organize unions, and fight for better working conditions and a decent wage, as I hope and believe they will. But many of the occasions will be different. And I want to try today to say something about what those different occasions might look like. I'm not a prophet. I can't identify the agents of changes to come, and I don't know what social categories we will use to describe them, class, gender, age, or, or something else entirely. <coughs> but there will be mobilizations and insurgencies in the name of democracy and social justice again and again. <coughs> we know why they will happen. The sense that life ought to be more fair than it usually is, the belief that the rule of the few over the many, the 1% over the 99%, isn't just. These intuitive understandings can't be eradicated. But what difficulties will future mobilizations face? And what are the chances of success? A year ago, if I'd asked myself those last questions before the Wall Street protests began, I would have given a grim answer. The power of corporations and banks in Washington, the influence of money in political campaigns promoted by the Supreme Court, the increasing control of the media by right-wing forces, all this made the chance of a significant popular insurgency seem very small. But politics is always, thankfully, unpredictable. And I'm now going to talk in a much more optimistic and open-ended way than I would have done in February 2011. Questions about the future are especially hard to answer in the context of globalization. In the old days, the state provided the space for political activity. The fight against <coughs> child labor, the fight for an eight-hour day, for factory safety, for a minimum wage, for unemployment insurance, for social security, for public health and medical care, for environmental protection, all this took place inside the nation state. The aim was to bring into power governments committed to social justice, governments that would act energetically to make new laws and enforce new regulations. Today, in the American political world, there are many critics of what's called big government. But the truth is that government got big because ordinary men and women wanted pasteurized milk for their children, wanted protection against epidemics, wanted their parents to live with dignity in old age, 
wanted consumer products that didn't explode or burst into flames, that weren't poisonous, that carried safety guarantees, wanted an industrial system that didn't require 12-hour days and child labor, wanted factories that didn't contaminate the environment, wanted doctors and hospitals that they could afford, and wanted much more that only government can deliver. And they were right to want those things. They are still right to want them. Realizing goods like these, bringing these benefits to all the people who need them, that's what social justice is about. And social justice requires democratic political organization and strong government. No left movement can give up on either of those. Many of the goods that I've just described can still be delivered inside the nation state. The domestic struggle for social justice continues, as we've seen in these last months. And I, I will want to say more about that later. But as a global economy comes into existence more and more powerfully, the struggle for justice will itself have to become global. And it, it isn't easy to see how that can happen. Where is the space for global political activity? The space for global economic activity is plain to see. Multinational corporations function easily in different countries. Capital and commodities cross borders without difficulty. Stock markets around the world react instantaneously to each other's ups and downs. But democratic political organizations have rarely in the past extended their activity into different countries. Political actors and political causes don't cross borders without difficulty. And political fortunes don't respond quickly to the ups and downs of distant parties and politicians. We can imagine global rules for child labor, for factory safety, for a minimum wage, and for environmental protection. But how and where can you organize a campaign for global rules of that sort? How do you mobilize men and women around the world the way the steel workers of Johnstown were mobilized? How do you make room for the political creativity of ordinary men and women? How do you bring people together who speak different languages, who believe in different religions, and who have had radically different political experiences? These seem to me critical questions for all seekers after social justice today. We have to become internationalists. For a long time, we've called ourselves internationalists, but we don't know how to do that. We can see the beginning of a political response to economic globalization in two different places, on two different levels, so to speak, governmental and non-governmental. Consider first the example of the European Union, which is a government beyond the nation state, regional, not global, but still suggesting the possibility of a widening space for political action. Whether the Union will survive the current economic crisis is, today, an open question. The commitment to deal with the crisis cooperatively, with strong states helping the weak ones, is far from wholehearted. It's barely a commitment. Though there have been admirable resource redistributions across the EU in the past. <coughs> one can see, or one can imagine, down the road, Euro parties and Euro unions organizing and campaigning in something that we might call Euro space. That is, a space from which national borders have been partially erased. The boundary lines turned, we might say, into dotted lines. But what will the political culture of a Euro party be like? In whose history will it find its ideological bearings? In what language will its leaflets be written, its meetings conducted? I suppose that just as household appliances these days come with instructions in many languages, so will politics be conducted in many languages. <coughs> Political actors will have to find ways to understand each other, to argue and negotiate, agree and disagree. More and more Europeans will be multilingual. Perhaps the moments of engagement and crea creativity will be even more exciting if they require political activists to break through the old barriers of culture and language. 
come to think of it, organizing the steel workers in Johnstown required the use not only of English, but of several Slavic languages. A second level of global political action can be found in international civil society. This is the world of the NGO, and the fact that we have become so familiar with that acronym is evidence of the real importance of organizations that operate simultaneously without government or authorization in domestic and international settings. I'm thinking of organizations like Oxfam, Human Rights Watch, Doctors Without Borders, and Greenpeace. So far, we don't have labor unions operating successfully in this way, though many call themselves international. And the NGOs I've listed are mostly, are entirely, organizations run by their staffs. They do not make for a participatory politics. They don't pull ordinary men and women into meetings and demonstrations. Still, their staffs are recruited in different countries, they raise money in different countries, they circulate petitions and collect signatures worldwide. So they may represent the beginning of a new kind of politics conducted across the boundaries of the nation state. I don't want to suggest, however, that we are anywhere near the end of the nation state's dominant role in our political life. We're looking for ways of adding global engagements. We're not ready to subtract domestic engagements. And so we need to imagine political movements that start somewhere, that have a local beginning, and then are imitated and reiterated in other countries, copycat insurgencies, relying on new modes of communication like those used in the Arab Spring. Of course, nothing in the world is new. Revolutions spread across Europe in 1848 without the internet, <laughs> without email, without television, without telephone. But we can now imagine much greater immediacy and much closer linkage. We have to recognize, though, that the space provided by the nation state is still the best political space we have. Consider, for example, the problems of environmental politics. Global warming is a global issue, but dealing with it requires hard political decisions in many different countries, in every country in the world, in fact, though what is required is not the same in every country. And if we are to figure out what the requirements are and how to meet them, we need NGOs working across boundaries, explaining what is happening and mobilizing support for the necessary changes. We need state officials negotiating with other state officials looking for the right balance of economic growth and ecological health. And we need political parties and social movements in each country, in every country, taking cues from each other, working to enact and enforce new environmental regulations. Internationalism is necessary in many other areas, and environmentalism is, I guess, just the most obvious. The economic issues with, with, with which I began have to be dealt with globally if we are to avoid a race to the bottom, with corporations shifting their activity from one place to another, always seeking the most vulnerable workforce and the weakest regulatory system. But we also need local uprisings, like the demonstrations for social justice in Spain and Israel, and like our own Wall Street protests whose participants should demand not only that their governments act to reduce inequality and produce jobs at home, but also that they seek to create a global economy that is more open to an equitable distribution of resources and opportunities. There are more examples. Feminist movements in hostile environments battling traditional religious hierarchies need help from outside and probably won't win until women around the world, and men too, find ways to express their solidarity. But these struggles begin at home with groups that know the strengths and weaknesses of the local patriarchal religious culture. Public health, another issue, is now and always global. Until recently, there was no way to track the diseases carried by merchants, mercenaries, tourists, and itinerant workers, and few ways of dealing with them. Today, we know much more about what to do, but we don't yet have strong constituencies in every country. 
demanding quick and competent governmental responses to contagious disease, responses consciously designed to protect rich and poor alike, and to provide vaccines, serums, and medicines that are not past their use-by dates to everyone who needs them on the basis of how sick they are, not on the basis of how much money they have. How should we think about the combination of local demand and popular uprisings on the one hand and global engagement on the other? It isn't all that different from the Johnstown strike and the help that came from outside, from the CIO, from Harrisburg, and from Washington. What is absolutely necessary is a genuine mobilization on the ground by the locals. Democracy and social justice are always the work of men and women organizing and acting where they live. What comes from the outside can only be a helping, never a ruling hand. There are certain kinds of political actors, certain kinds of politics that pretend to promote social justice, but never do. I mean the vanguard politics of men and women who think that they know the course of history or the word of God, and who claim that they should therefore rule over the rest of us. About these revolutionaries, the Irish poet William Butler Yeats has written a nice couple of lines. Hurrah for revolution and more cannon shot. A beggar upon horseback lashes a beggar on foot. Hurrah for revolution and cannon shot again. The beggars have changed places, but the lash goes on. There's also the politics of terrorists who think that they have found a shortcut to utopia and who reject the nonviolent mobilization, the civic action of ordinary people. They want to liberate the people, Trotsky once wrote, without the participation of the people. And then there's the politics of experts, the superior wonks, contemporary versions of Plato's philosopher kings who disdain the messiness and the delays and the compromises that always come with democracy. The alternative to vanguards, terrorists, experts, to Yeats's beggars on horseback, is the sovereignty of the people. That is, of men and women organized in parties and unions and many different kinds of associations, actively engaged, defending their interests and their values. Here, our two goals, democracy and social justice, come together. We commonly think of social justice as being about how taxes are allocated, about how welfare is provided, and to whom. More generally, about the distribution of social goods and social bads, the benefits and burdens of our common life. But social justice is also about the distribution of political power, and democracy is the right way to distribute political power. Democracy is the political version of justice, and one of its greatest advantages is that it opens the way for the social version of justice. That's what was going on in Johnstown, where the pursuit of social justice was stymied temporarily by the ability of the steel company to buy political power. Well, it's still possible in this country and in many others to buy political power, and that is not a just or even a decent mode of distribution. So the fight for democracy in places like Johnstown in the 1930s and around the world today is a fight for social justice. And similarly, the mobilization of citizens for a genuinely progressive income tax, say, or for national health insurance is a fight for democracy and also a realization of it. Of course, the mobilization against these things may also be an expression of democracy if it is a genuine mobilization of people and not only of money, if it draws ordinary men and women into political activity. Democracy at its best makes for conflict because people disagree about how social goods and bads should be distributed. I've been celebrating one side in these conflicts, our side, the side of all the people who have been dispossessed, silenced, held down, since their rising up seems to me a moment that we ought to celebrate. But these people, too, disagree among themselves. And one of the things that they do when they rise up 
is to join an argument from which they have always been excluded. An argument about exactly what justice requires. And when citizens, free from the oppressive hierarchies of wealth and power, argue among themselves about social justice, that is social justice. How these arguments will be conducted in a global age, how we will manage to help local activists struggling for democracy and for a just distribution of goods and bads, how we can make political cooperation possible across borders, turn international civil society into an arena for political work. The answer to these kinds of questions always comes unexpectedly, not from people like me, not from elderly professors, but from a new generation of men and women who suddenly decide that they won't do what they are expected to do. Struggles like the <coughs> Struggles like the one in Johnstown will be returned. They will happen again, and they will bring important social gains like the transformation of working class life that was the effect of 20th century unionization, which may or may not build toward greater gains. If they do build, if the advance is sustained, if the benefits of political action accumulate over time, that is Weber's slow grinding, the gradual improvement of the common life or in another more famous metaphor, the long march toward a more egalitarian and a more just society. The long march, writes Milan Kundera in his novel, The Unbearable Likeness of Being, the long march is the kitsch of the left, our sentimental melodrama. But it's only kitschy if we pretend to be advancing when we are not, if we shout avanti while standing still or running the other way, or if we pretend that the march is inevitable, that we have some kind of guarantee from history that all movement is forward. In fact, much of the time we're not marching at all, but stumbling, slogging, limping along. Still, it's important to keep going, even while we admit to ourselves that there will be setbacks and detours and terrible reversals. It's important to keep, keep going because justice and equality matter every day in the lives of real people, you and me, and all the others. But the politics of social justice is also something else. Besides the global march that we hope for, different from the march, it isn't only focused on the future. It isn't only forward-looking. We don't just tell stories about the glories that will come down the road someday. Democracy and social justice also have a presence in the here and now, even if here and now doesn't mean all the time. They are manifest in those wonderful moments of insurgency, when human capacities are suddenly revealed, when men and women deploy the talents they never knew they had, and we get a glimpse of what is possible beyond what is possible right now. And that's what keeps us going. That is the single most important reason to join our political struggle. to support them, the problems, to have a movement like the, the movement you saw in, in, that, in your town, to participate in something, where, be it socialism or not, I mean, the name doesn't matter so long as the progressive policies are put in place. How, how do you sway public opinion? 
Um, I, I, there is no political scientist in the United States who predicted the uh, Wall Street uh, occupation. Um, I, I don't know how to cause something like that. There is no expert on Arab politics who predicted what happened a year ago in Tunisia and Egypt. There was not a single Sovietologist who predicted the fall of the Soviet Union. We, we don't have the kind of knowledge that a, a, a good answer to your question would, would require. We, we, we know that there are forms of political work that we have to engage in on a routine basis, day after day, and, and, and suddenly, one day, there will be um, those, those, that work will produce an insurgency. But, but how and when, I don't know. Yes, go on. I, I guess my question was not so much about the insurgency. I guess my question is, how do you get, obviously the people in the Middle East believe for decades that, the, the, um, that these problems existed that they, it was an unjust world, that their leaders were despots. But how do you get, I mean, how, how do you, I mean, that's an important question, to get turn that um, belief into um, action. But I guess in this country, I don't think the belief is there at all. And uh, for, for even, so how do you get that belief into people in the first place? There are an awful lot of people in trouble in the United States today. And that accounts for the response that the occupation has got. Um, not actually a political response in the strong sense, but all of the opinion polls showed remarkable support for what often looked like rather ragged encampments of marginal, of marginal people. Um, so there is a, there are opportunities. Um, and one, one thing that I would say in, in, um, is very, very important and which the left has often forgotten is that you do not approach ordinary people who disagree with you and tell them that they are suffering from false consciousness. <laughs> um, you, you, have to, you have to engage with their understanding of the, of the world. And you have to accept that it is, in some sense, a, a possible understanding, a possibly rational understanding with which we disagree. And we want to explain why we disagree. But we do it with respect. Uh, the, the left has often been, even when it had, even when it was a mass movement, which it isn't today, has, has often had been extraordinarily arrogant, and especially its vanguards, its elites, its um, the people who call themselves our leaders, um, have, have again and again um, claimed to have a kind of knowledge of the world, which is like the knowledge that religious zealots claim, or which has the same quality of certainty. And, and that is not a way to build the democratic politics. We have to talk to, to people. The, the lesson is organize. We have to be out there organizing. Um, and we have to hope for the, the, the fire that sometimes comes. Or kind of worker-based organizations such as that, um, do you forecast things like this um, transcending this bound of nation state as you can see? Or do you think they will continue to fail doing these other things that other NGOs have do in the way you state that they have failed before? Uh, first of all, I do not believe that we are through with the nation state. Um, in fact, I, 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 what I really believe is that what, what the, the poorest and most oppressed people in the world today need is a decent nation state of their own, a state that acts on their behalf. We, we have not finished the, the development of the state system. There are still people without states, like the Palestinians and the Kurds and the Tibetans, 
And there are people with failed states, with ineffective states, with, with, with states that are, uh, that, that plunder their own populations rather than help them. Um, the state is still the only political agent that can deliver economic regulation, that can deliver education, that can deliver welfare. Um, the only agent. The only agent we have, and uh, I, I don't like the, the political scientists who talk in, uh, in highfalutin ways about the transcendence of the nation state. I don't think we're anywhere near there. But we do live in a globalizing economy, and we have to think about ways of working across the borders of nation states and unions and parties. Now, capitalists think that way all the time, um, but the left has to learn to think, has to think that way. Unions and parties have to work across, across borders. It, may, it will happen in Europe first, I think. There will be Euro parties and Euro unions organizing across all the lines. Uh, but we have to think of ways of doing that in other places, too. Europe, right? Oh. In your speech, you talked about sort of the recurrence of progressive movements in history, um, mirroring talking, you know, about what happened in your hometown of John, uh, Johnstown and, uh, you know, what happened in 1848 to what's happening in Arab, Arab Spring and the Occupy movement. And so I guess my question is, how can we look back at these, like, past revolutionary movements and learn from them? Because even though a lot of... Uh, <laughs> Great interesting things happened in 1848. From France to Austria, it was a failure. And I, personally, um, even though I love reading about the Arab Spring and I'm still really hopeful, I have personal doubts about the directions that some of the revolutions are going. And how can we look at what's happening currently in the Arab Spring, what's happened in the past in revolutionary movements to sort of influence where we can make a change, in, specifically in like the Occupy movement and things that are happening in our domestic uh, area? We're right. We have known many failures and many very partial and temporary successes. Um, and I, I think the, the, um, uh, the, the Arab Spring is, is the, the beginning of what will be a very, very long and torturous process that may end with a decent democratic, social democratic, societies, but is not going to do that soon, because the, the people who made the revolution represented a very thin layer of Egyptian uh, society. Um, well placed to lead a revolution against a tyrant, but not well placed to win elections and to govern the, the country. Um, and so what we have to hope for in those, in those places uh, is that however the, 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 um, the, whatever kind of state emerges, that there are spaces, political spaces within it where liberals and Democrats and social Democrats can, can organize and sustain um, uh, both an intellectual and a political existence and when and when we see people operating in those spaces, we have to find ways to help them. With, with, with money, with political support, maybe sometimes with the support of if, if there is a decent government in, a, in, in this country or some other country with, with diplomatic support. Um, we, we have to become internationalists, but internationalists knowing that our connections in places like Egypt are going to be with relatively small groups of people who have a future, but who are not um, at, at present very, very strong. Um, and I, I don't know what to say about the future of the Occupy movement. We, 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 we've been carrying a lot of stuff on the Descent website about that, and we will be carrying a lot more. <coughs> trying to figure out what happened. Was it an uprising? Was it a flare-up? Um, how do you turn something like this into 
a movement. And I, I suspect that there can't be a movement of the 99%. That's a, that's a, that, that exists only in the populist imagination. Um, if there is to be a movement, it will be a movement, it will, the people who have to be reached and organized are the people who are hurting most because of the growing inequality of the United, in the United States today. Um, the, the, the traditional poor and the newly vulnerable have to be pulled into a kind of a, a movement that has goals, that has there were many general assemblies where people didn't want to talk about goals, but a, a movement has to have um, a program. It has to it has to aim at achievements that will materially benefit the people in the movement, because because social movements are I called unionization a, 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 a mobilization of self help. That's what movements have to be. And so you have to reach the people who need help and to help them help themselves. It is true that um, insofar as we live in democratic states, we have um, obligations, commitments to our fellow citizens that are different from the commitments we have to the people outside. Um, because we share, um, uh, uh, we share not only a, a geographical space, we share a place in history. We are determining, if we are, if we are a democracy, we are determining our children's and grandchildren's future. We're doing that together. Uh, and that's an important human, that's an important thing to be doing. Um, but it's not the end of our obligations, just as um, our commitments to our own children are the end of our obligations. We are also committed to the children of the Republic, so to speak. And we have commitments beyond, beyond the republic. And if we are socialists, then we uh, then we have we have undertaken commitments beyond those of everybody else. We have undertaken a, a commitment to uh, to work for um, social justice across borders, and we have undertaken a commitment to help people in trouble in this. this um, but should that help be institutionalized, as you were talking about through governmental or non-governmental organizations, or should it be through individuals like socialists, as you say, kind of like individual organizations that do like philanthropy, or should it be more like system-based? Well, look, um, I, I do believe in um, resource transfers across borders, and um, that would require, that obviously requires state action. Um, but if you think about some other activity like democracy, for the promotion of democracy, um, I think the promotion of democracy should not, um, should, should, <coughs> democracy should not be promoted by armies crossing borders. Um, regime change is something that has to be done by the people who live under and endure the oppression of the regime. But we can help, not, not we as, um, as 
citizens of the United States uh, urging our government to do this or that, but we as members of unions and parties and organizations um, that, that have some, that can have some kind of global reach. We can help dissidents in, uh, in, 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 in oppressive countries, uh, partly sometimes just by publicizing what they are what they are doing because regimes are much less likely to kill and imprison dissidents who are known international, who have international reputations. We can help uh, sometimes by providing um, R and R for for people in uh, in countries who have been um, who have been working very very hard in dangerous environments and need a, a year off. Um, and sometimes we can help by going there ourselves, the way uh, many um, European leftists went to the East European bloc to teach in secret universities and, uh, and to speak to, um, to uh, organizations uh, that met in somebody's living room or in somebody's basement. Um, those are things we can do, and that is a, a democracy promotion which does not involve coercion. Finds that objectionable, except maybe the laps in the north. 
um, who were for many, many years discriminated against. But now, after years of political efforts, Norway is moving toward a kind of multiculturalism, which gives the Laps room to have not a state of their own, they're a tiny group, but some autonomy <coughs> in their own lives. And that's what we have to uh, work for. The nation state is, in fact, it's not only the dominant <coughs> political formation in the world today, it's the most popular political formation in the world today. Palestinians, Kurds, Tibetans, they want a state of their own, and they have reasons. Jews and Armenians know what those reasons are, and how vulnerable people without states can be. <coughs> but once you have, once we have this is my imagination, uh, my uh, internationalist imagination. Once we have completed the state system, once everybody or most people are living in decent states of their own, which work on their behalf, then we can begin turning the, the lines into the other line. We can begin imagining trade blocks, cooperation of all sorts across the across the borders. We can begin imagining regional associations like the, like the EU. But, but the EU was made possible by the definitive settlement after World War II of the European state system. That's, that's what made it possible. And um, we need definitive settlements of that sort in other parts of the world. And then we can begin talking about about how to work, to work in, in, in good ways, uh, economically, politically, socially, across borders. Now you talked about how currently you view the nation state as being a necessity for um, you know, different countries to have. But you seem to, at least I've gotten the impression that you think ultimately the nation state would not be necessary and that um, politics would be governed more by international sort of governing bodies. Now, I mean, with this current nation state model that we have, we already see the potential for power to corrupt and the ability of corporate interests to mani uh, manipulate their decisions. How would we prevent that from happening through to these international kind of governing bodies? That would be of, of the future. Yes, you're, you're, you're just describing the arenas of future political struggles. I, I'm not sure what ultimately means. I, the nation state will be with us for a, for a very, very long time. But we can, as I said, we have to begin to think of, 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 of social democratic versions of the IMF, of the trade organization. Um, that's, we, we need international regulatory bodies that act not on behalf of, of corporate wealth, but on behalf of ordinary people. And as I said, we, we, we know, we knew, we, we were able to achieve that in the nation state, in the 19th century. That was the, the struggle of, of socialist and social democratic parties. Um, but but where, how, do we, how do we carry that struggle to a global level? How do you challenge the IMF? How do you, recruit, how do you transform the IMF into a, a social democratic body? not that we don't need an IMF, we do need it, but we need it in a different kind. And um, I suspect even that, in terms of, for a long time to come, the political struggles will be in powerful nation states like this one that can, if we win here, reshape the international world. You mentioned earlier that the right has traditionally been more willing to work across the borders than the left. Why is it that you think that the right side of the spectrum has more propensity for that than the left? And why is it that the left has less propensity? Well, the, um, the, 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 you're right. All I talked about was how capitalism works across the borders. But if you think back, um, uh, the old aristocracies were international. Um, the old royal houses were international, intermarrying, and um, the, the mobilization of Europe against the French Revolution was a mobilization of an international aristocracy. Uh, 
Um, and they are, they can, the reason the left is more local is because our, our people are the people who live here and who don't travel around to the capitals of Europe and, and, and marry aristocrats in other places. They are the people who live here, who speak this language, and whose attachments are here. The, it's the, the, um, it's the democracy and nationalism go together. It's the mo when, when we mobilize the people, the previously inarticulate, speechless people, when we help them speak, they speak in, in a language of their own. And they are, they are locally situated in a way that, that uh, the very, very rich and the aristocratic and the royals aren't. Your, your piece, your short article, um, Town Meetings and Worker Control, is probably one of my favorite cases for economic democracy and socialism. I was wondering if you could explain um, the sort of, or you know, summarize that article to people, um, sort of the basic argument how uh, a, the owners of a business have no more right to control a business than a king has the right to govern a nation of people. Right, well, it, this was also an argument that started in Johnstown. Um, uh, because Bethlehem Steel was so all-powerful and because there was a company store and the workers were paid in script that they could only spend at the company store, and this was <coughs> obviously not just a, a market operation, it was a political, it was a political operation, <coughs> and it was run um, by the with, with, by, by wealth and power. And um, I argued that that couldn't be right any more than it was right in territorial uh, organizations. We, when, when, we, when, when we imagine a, a territorial unit, a town, a county, a, a state, a province, um, we immediately think that it's obvious that the people who, uh, who live there should be the people who uh, vote in the election and shape its, its, and argue about its policies and shape its, uh, its policies. Um, so why is it an economic organization the same? Um, here is a, it, it, it isn't it isn't locally centered in the same way, but it is a political organization which should be run by its members, by its citizens, by its workers. Now, you, you can imagine many different ways of, of doing that. Um, we have chosen, in the best circumstances, we have chosen for an adversarial system like, like much else in, in this country. Uh, Unions <coughs> organize and then um, represent the workers, we hope, in a, in a democratic, through democratic procedures. And then they, they deal with, contest, or negotiate with uh, the, the managers and owners of the factory or the industry. Um, and that is a kind of democracy. It is an adversarial kind of democracy. Um, and it, it has produced, um, as I said, it produced the end of the, of the tyranny of the foreman on the factory floor. It produced uh, pensions and, um, and decent working conditions and health care. Um, it isn't yet full democracy, and I think there are interesting experiments in other parts of the world um, that, that try to, to transcend the adversarial system by bringing union representatives into management. Now, there are some militant workers who think that's not a good idea, that, that there are inherent conflicts between workers and management, and the conflict should be fought out. And that the presence of union members on management, in management, is a kind of co-option. So we could argue about what what kind of industrial democracy or factory democracy we, we, we want. It's a it's a it's a good argument, but it is an argument that has a certain flavor of the past. 
because it doesn't, it's not easy to think how it applies to workers in the service. <coughs> For them, I think the adversarial model is almost certainly going to be the, the right one. We can't imagine um, an industrial democracy in the supermarkets, in the hotels. Justice for janitors requires the kind of campaign that we saw in many cities in this country. Um, because I'm afraid it's not going to require um, the kind of, of um, worker self government that we want to hope. My name is Scott I'm from Wesleyan. I just want to thank you for coming and everything you said so far. Um, my question is domestically about the U.S. Um, it seems like you're very optimistic that we can really move the country forward in a, a better direction. I'm just wondering how you think we should be able to deal with Citizens United, which sort of prevents sort of, you know, it, it kind of allows for rich politicians to come into being. It sort of allows capital to continue to win the battles as opposed to us. And do you think the right step is to move forward with what like Bernie Sanders is trying to do? with a constitutional amendment to overturn that? And if so, how do we actually make that a reality? Well, look, this is a fight that has to be fought in every possible venue. Uh, yes, we should look at a constitutional amendment. Um, and, and I suspect that if pressure, if, if the campaign for a constitutional amendment won just a few victories, there might well be a reversal on the, on the court. Um, and we, should, and we should look for um, uh, states like Montana, which challenge uh, this ruling on the basis of their own constitution. Um, I'm, I'm not a states' rights uh, advocate, but, but there are times when that, that the state is the best place to fight. Um, and if we ever control Congress again, we should simply pass again the law that the court declared unconstitutional, but it, it forced them to, to do it again. Um, because uh, um, courts have changed their minds um, as the, as, under popular pressure, as in the days of the New Deal. When the saying was a, a switch in time saved nine, uh, that may happen again. Journalism of exposure is one of our weapons, and we haven't used it um, anywhere near enough in the face of the kind of the uses of capitalist power today. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Yeah. Um, so over the past 20 or 30 years, I've really, uh, I think that we've seen kind of an individualization of responsibility when it comes to the environmental movement for environmental justice. 
So um, I see that most prevalent today in what we call like green consumerism or green capitalism. So it's all up to me to save the planet. All I have to do is buy a hybrid and shop organic and all of these things. Uh, and as part of that, there's been a you know, depoliticization. People don't see it as much of a, as a political issue anymore. Uh, and so obviously, I think that we need to make it a political issue and make it um, a collective issue. And I was curious if you had any thoughts on that and how we could uh, maybe advance that, uh, that environmental justice yes. cause. Yes, I wish I could tell you. I'm not much of a strategist. <laughs> Uh, or, or just uh, philosophical. I, 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 I certainly recognize the, uh, the, this process, which doesn't, uh, it isn't only with regard to the environment. We've, we've seen it in other, in other areas where um, individuals are told that, um, that if, they, if they stop buying food that contains all sorts of additives, supporting uh, uh, the health of the future generations, not only their own, but they will be active it's like a political act. And um, I don't think it doesn't make sense to come out against that. But I think again and again, we have to insist that the victories are not won without, um, without political organization. Now, to think of something like the um, United Farm Workers and the Lettuce Boycott way back in the, I guess it was the 60s. Um, so we didn't buy lettuce from California and we felt very virtuous. Um, but in fact, because so many of us did, because there was a political organization that was urging us not to buy lettuce, it wasn't just an individual act. However good we felt about ourselves, we were we were joining a movement, and we did that. And that's you, without the movement, the act of individual virtue doesn't mean a lot. Can I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> I just want to know what you thought the role. I, I assume you think of yourself as a public intellectual, and I was wondering about the role of the public intellectual, and if you think there was a strand of anti-intellectual. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I do think there's a, a strand of um, anti-intellectualism, and sometimes living in the academy and listening to my colleagues, I sometimes share. <laughs> Don't, uh, we shouldn't underestimate um, uh, 
people on the, on the right <coughs> watching the, um, the, the primary debates. It's easy to do, but, but we shouldn't. We shouldn't do that. I don't. I, I think we, we, need, uh, we need to develop in every possible way our own intellectual resources. We have not prevent, presented to the American people um, a vivid picture of what a better society as we conceive it would, would look like. And, and that is where our intelligence should be focused. One more question. Um, let's see. I don't know who had their hand up the wall. Do you guys? Let's say guy in the glasses. Last question, please. Um, my question is about the NGO design, like what working across cross borders to promote democracy. I was kind of wondering you predicted as the future of the NGO right now, with Russia agitating about the fact that US NGOs have been funding insurrections against uh, Putin's power and the Egyptians pressing <coughs> charges with NGOs and the Chinese having problems with NGOs. I'm wondering if repressive regimes have kind of learned a lesson and decided that perhaps the operation of NGOs in their borders isn't something they're going to tolerate anymore. Uh, I just kind of want to know what you think about that and if there's going to be a negative backlash against the videos or <coughs> and democracy promotion throughout the world. Yeah. Um, well, it, that's a sign that they think this kind of politics is affecting uh, if they are afraid of it. Um, and uh, yes, they will try to repress it. If it, if, if it is effective, they will try to repress it. And we have to try to be. Uh, to avoid or work around uh, their their repression. I don't um, look. Here's an example of, of internationalism. Um, after the Serbian um, revolution or whatever it was that they, um, that they created a, a, a democratic. There were there were um, orange and uh, roads or something revolutions in Georgia and the Ukraine, and not surprisingly, perhaps, if you are as an internationalist, um, young Serbian radicals played an important part in each of those countries in 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 uh, helping to and organize a democratic revolt. It wasn't a great success in either of those countries, but, but um, it was um, a democratic uprising. And these people from outside played an important role. And I suspect that American NGOs funded their work. Um, OK, that's that kind of democracy promotion does not involve coercive state power. That seems to me fine. And if, if it works, um, tyrannical governments are going to try to, to stop it. That's, um, that's, we should take that as an encouragement. It's a, it's a sign that, that we have hit upon a tactic that has some uh, potential. OK, that's it.